Hello and welcome to this episode of Talk the Talk, RTRFM's weekly show about linguistics, the science of language. For the next hour, we're going to be bringing you language news, language around the world, and some great music. Maybe we'll even hear from you. My name is Daniel Midgley. I'm here with Ben Ainsley. Good morning. And Kylie Sturgis. Good night, everyone. On this episode, we are continuing our discussion of a controversial paper about how languages get started. When you start talking about Creole languages, the linguistic becomes the political very quickly. So what are linguists saying about this work? We're going to find out on this episode of Talk the talk uh, we did a bit of a like a Simpsons two part special end of a season kind of thing last <laughs> episode. Continued. Yeah, we've got a <laughs> we've got to resolve the gauntlet that is but kind of been placed politely right in the middle of creologists kind of world. Before we do that, before we pick up the gauntlet and look at it and be like, "Damn, that's a gauntlet." That's a gauntlet. We have to find out what's going on in the world of linguistics in the week gone past. We love to put stories out there about minority languages, especially the minority languages of Australia. Ding and, ding 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 ding. Uh, yes. Love it. And uh, Kylie, you had the chance to talk a little while ago with somebody who's doing something with the Mirawong language. So the Mirawong language of the East Kimberley and Northern Territory has a about 20 speakers. Right. So and, and it is right on the ragged edge of extinction. In yeah. fact, there's only 10 people who can speak it fluently. Yeah, and they're all super old. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Now, when this happens, <laughs> it's not looking good no. for our minority language, unless you can get young kids speaking it. And, and that's what's happened, yeah. Knut Olawaski, who is the senior linguist of a dictionary on this particular language, had a chance to speak to me here on RTRFM, and he had some amazing tales to tell us about how the language is still going to be spread throughout the community, and particularly with young children taught in schools, and all the right things that should be done with a language that is being endangered. G'day. Hey, good day there. It's great to hear that you're down to it. I'm interested in what's happening up north. Oh, it's fascinating. This is this is brilliant. Yeah, let's see what we can do about all the, the amazing languages we have in Australia and, and keeping them going. Tell us, how many people are, are learning this language? What's it like at the moment? Oh, all right. Uh, I guess in terms of uh, population of Mirong, there's probably about 1,500, but... Um, not too many people speak the language anymore. Huh. Um, and then, as you know, there's various reasons for that in history. Um, but we are definitely trying to bring the language back. So we've got a, uh, for example, we've got a children's program that reaches up to 400 kids a week. That's brilliant. Um, uh, we've got an adult class. Um, we are working with the schools. So overall, I'd say there must be at least 500 learners. Tell us about the region. Where, where does this language come from? Where, where are we talking about? If we walk into the... All oh, right. Well, the far north, um, right next to the NT border, we've got Kananara. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mirong is spoken in the wider Kananara area of WA, but also across the border. So not that there are many people living there, but that is traditionally Mirong country as well. How are kids learning it? It's integrated in schools? How do they get into the language? Yes, we, we have what we call a language nest team, which is based on a Maori approach from New Zealand, ah. where we um, spend a bit of time uh, with groups of kids uh, in immersion, so trying to just speak the language and not use English at all, uh, at least for a very short time, sessions of about half an hour or so. And we've got a, a mobile team that goes from group to group. So we've got uh, daycare centers, um, we've got the, the two schools in Kananara, and uh, we're currently going up from basically year, well, age one to about year three at school. And the younger years are, of course, really important when it comes to learning a language and maintaining it, isn't Absolutely it? Absolutely is, because um, it's so much easier for them to learn a language. Um, and the language is difficult, so as an adult, well, uh, you would struggle, but um, it's so much easier to teach young kids because they still have that language learning ability and they're also really motivated and committed to learning it. What's it like for teachers out there? If there's a small number of people who are, um, as you say, fluent in the language, what's it like for the, for the teachers who are going out and, and spreading the word? Well, our teachers are actually uh, mostly younger people who are not really fluent themselves. So ah. They just try to be as fluent as they can and learning from the old people so once or twice a week we get together with the old people that are still fluent in the language and our teachers get their input from them Mm -hmm. and well at this stage the project has been running for the last uh, three and a half years so the 
proficiency levels are not that high yet and our teachers are still okay but I think they're going to be um, overrun by the kids soon because the <laughs> kids are learning faster than their teachers. So, and this is where it's so important to actually have some resources at hand, like the dictionary we've just published. And we call it the Merong Wolang Yawurung Award. That's the Merong lexicon for all or for everybody. And we're very happy to see young people and adults starting to use it. I'm speaking to the senior linguist of a in- new indigenous dictionary, uh, the Marawang language. His name is Kanut Olawoski. It must be uh, quite a lot of community support to make this happen because there's a- obviously a lot of hands at work to-, to spread the word about the language. Oh, yes. Well, this project has been long in the making. Um, it's actually the first... Uh, I mean, linguists started working on this language 40 years ago, ah. not including myself. I've only been here 12 years. Um, but we've had this idea of having um, a dictionary for the public uh, that everybody everybody can just buy. Uh, we've had that idea for years, and um, now this is finally the first time we got something that uh, people can get their hands on. And now there's an app as well, isn't there? What, what does that involve? That's right. So the app, uh, we developed that a couple of years back, um, which is a smartphone app which uh, includes um, a dictionary. has not a, quite as many words as the, the print version, um, but there's still over a thousand words in it. Um, it has a Mirong English and an English Mirong uh, side. It's got some language games. It's got a, a word of the day function that you can push and just get surprised by the latest word. And, yeah, it's got some other features as well that are quite useful. I'm looking at it now, in fact. Uh, so t- tell us about um, what's been the response so far to this app. I can see you've got letters and sounds, body and health, people and family, culture. Mm. Well, uh, the response has been great because it's free. Um, <laughs> That's uh, always a great for, start. Yes. <laughs> for a free app, it can actually do quite a lot. So uh, oh, we're very glad we've got this and especially in a modern world where almost everybody's starting to walk around with a smartphone Mm. it's quite useful but on the other side well we did want the print version because um you don't need to be online for that yes um and you don't need a smartphone you don't need the technology so it might seem a bit old-fashioned but really uh we can see people walking around with it putting it in their pocket and pulling it out when they need to know a word we keep working on updating these resources, so I guess in a year or two years' time, uh, we'd like to see a second edition of this dictionary that involves a lot of words that um, haven't been created yet. Um, huh? And what I mean by this is, well, the Merong people live in a world that is full of things that we don't traditionally have a name for. So obviously there's no word for app. Mm. Uh, there's no word for computer. In fact, there's no word for mobile phone, if you want, <laughs> and for radio station. So these are um, uh, words that we are uh, trying to create and integrate them into the modern Merong language. And uh, we hope in a few years' time we'll be able to actually um, put these words in a next edition of a dictionary or in an updated version of the app. Thank you so much for speaking to us here on the Sound Alternative Canute. Thanks very much for your call. Thank you. I started downloading the app as we were chatting so I could play around with it, which is always a good sign. I mean, just hearing going, oh, really? There's an app for that. Okay, yeah, let's check I, it out. I downloaded it myself. Yeah. There's like 1,300 words, more or less, yeah, and uh, it's kind of fun to play around with. And it works with iOS 11, the new one, which is nice. Mm, and I had it on my Android, so yeah, g- give it a oh, shot. Oh, cross-pollination across device platforms, that's good. Did you notice any similarities between what he was saying and our discussion with uh, Dahlia Pigram from uh, the Yauru language? Do you Absolutely. mean other than or just all of them? Just all the similarities? There was quite a few. <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> it's the same kind of story all the way around. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Just get the kids engaged, involved. But I mean, I guess my brain goes, cool. Let's check back in 25 years. Kind of. Yeah, like the, like that's the kind of time scale we kind of have to work on, really, isn't it? The prognosis for minority languages, it's It's tough. Yeah, it's grim. if they survive, they're going to be changed forever. So here's what you can do. You can download the app for different platforms. And if you want to help the staff and the volunteers working to preserve the Mirong language, you can donate. That's Mirima, M-I-R-I-M-A, 
www.org.au. We'll have a link on our blog, talkthetalkpodcast.com. And on that sumptuous treat, should we take a track? Yes. Since we're interested in making sure these languages wake up, let's hear Awake by Tycho on RTRFM 92.1. Oh, it's time to pick up that gauntlet, I think. Last week, we spoke with Damien Blasi about his work in Creole linguistics. Quick catch up. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like a 20 seconds or less roundup of the previous show and where we're at. I'm ready. You go, Ben. Pigeons came about when two different language groups came together, had to sort themselves out somehow. That was a pigeon. It was very simple. It was very basic. That would turn into a Creole when that generation's kids came of age and they brought grammar to it. Then Damien came along and he was like, Psh, not on my watch. And he basically did a bunch of study. And it turns out that there is no impoverished pigeon stage for a lot of Creole languages. And there is also no such thing, potentially, as a Creole language. They're just languages. And this is big deal. A lot of linguists, uh, I'm not going to say unhappy, but they're like, damn, that's a big deal. And now we're up to Return of the Jedi. (laughs) (laughs) Take us through it, narrator. Damien Blasi, Susanna Maria, Michaelis, and Martin Haspelmath used a ton of data to show that, number one, we don't have evidence for a pigeon stage in the development of a Creole. Number two, they just pick up where their parent languages left off. That's where they pull their grammar from. And number three, there isn't really anything that you can point to and say, aha, you're a Creole. It's very messy. There's a lot of gray area. But there are some linguists who study Creoles that are clapping back. And chief among them is John McCormick. Werder. He teaches linguistics at Columbia University. He's the host of the great podcast Lexicon Valley. We've had him on the show before talking about his book, The Language Hoax. He disagrees with all three of the points in this article. Bam. So a second gauntlet has been thrown down next to the first. So I got the chance to ask him, what was some of the background behind this work and why is this such a contentious area? Well, what what this basically comes down to is that there's been a movement in Creole studies, especially over about the past 20 years, to show that Creoles are not a kind of language, that if you didn't know the history of the language, you couldn't tell it from any other language. And all of that is part of a general, usually unspoken, but powerful current in the subfield, which is that there's a sense that Creole studies is designed to show the world that Creoles are not defective languages. And what comes along with that is an idea that certainly there is no such thing as a Creole other than how these languages came about, that they're not a different kind of language. And so, one current of this is an idea that the old notion that a Creole begins as a pigeon and then gets fleshed out into being a regular language is inaccurate, and that really all Creole languages are is mixtures. So, For example, if you're in Australia, many people might be more familiar, actually, than people in America with the fact that there was a pigeon that formed on the eastern coast of Australia and in the islands eastward of there, and that it became a full language now called Tukpisan in some places, Bislama elsewhere, Solomon Islands, Pidgin. Those are full languages, but the idea is that they began as pigeons. The new idea is that those languages are relatively unique, and that if you look at Creole languages around the world, these very different forms of European languages around the world that formed, for example, on plantations, that they didn't form like Tukpisan, that they had this whole different birth, that they're just what happens when European meets African. And the fact that, say, Jamaican Creole differs from English in the same way as Tukpisan does, or Haitian Creole is different from French in the same way as Tukpisan is different from English, all of that's just an accident. The the plantation creoles are just what happens when languages came together. And so the idea is that anybody who thinks that, say, Haitian Creole is what happened when somebody learned a pidgin French and then built it back up into a different language is naive, that what we're missing is that all that happened was that French met African languages. And so there was no failure involved. It's one of the oddest things I've ever encountered, given that I had no idea of these currents when I came into the field almost 30 years ago. What a lot of these people are worried about is that they don't like the idea that these languages would have begun in something that someone couldn't do. So even if we say the person created a pigeon and then they made it into a whole new language, I always thought of that as a victory. The new idea is, no, nobody ever failed. They just mixed these things together. Now, I should be very explicit. Blasey... Michaelis and Haspelmath are not 
socio-politically motivated in particular. I would venture to say that Blasi and Michaelis, Michaelis is a dear friend of mine, but they certainly are committed to showing that Creoles are real languages. The ones who are most vociferous about implying that to think of a plantation Creole as having begun as a pigeon is racist. I mean, this is it, it isn't said openly that often, but that is the assumption. The ones who are angry at anybody who assumes that say, the Creole languages of Suriname or Papiamentu or Cape Virgin Creole began as pigeons are Michelle de Graff of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Sali Coco Mufwene of the University of Chicago, Enoch Abo, I am right now blanking on his institution. It's in Western Europe, but he's a syntactician. And then Umberto Ansaldo, who is centered in Hong Kong. Those four are on a particular crusade to accuse any linguist who thinks most Creoles began as pigeons of being, one, a bad linguist, and two, racist, or I suppose it would be difficult to call me a racist, but I'm a colonialist, and so I have you know, given in to these, these, these ideas. And this has been going on for a long time, and I hate to say that the idea that a Creole didn't begin as a pigeon has a certain appeal, even beyond those four, because it sounds like, well... We've been misjudging these languages just like the West has often misjudged poor black people, which is who speak most Creole languages. I can certainly see the appeal of saying, hey, everybody, Creoles are normal. You know, they didn't come from an impoverished background. Yeah. We, we have seen in the case of Talk Pisin and some others um, that no, they actually do come from pigeons. But do you think that that really is true, that those are atypical cases? Or can you think of a lot more? <laughs> not atypical at all. It's really very simple. If you have um, a Creole like Haitian or less familiar ones, such as the ones spoken in Suriname in South America, which are my specialty, like Suriname or Saramakan, the history is so dim. Those languages formed in the late 1600s and nobody was really writing much of anything down at all. So we'll never really know. Other Creoles formed more recently when literacy was more widespread. And so by the time talk pissing was becoming a real language, there were people sitting around writing down what was going on. And so you can see how a language like talk pissing, you look at English, you look at the various languages of the region, you look at talk pissing, the difference in terms of meaningless elaboration is painfully clear. You look at that language and you think, well, how did that form? And there's documentation of it beginning as a pigeon. And there are people in Australia, and they are about to have painstakingly documented it. Uh, you know, one of the things that I drum into my sociolinguistics classes is that language is a proxy for identity, and that really seems to be the case here. We we think we're talking about languages, but we can't help but talk about the people that speak them. It's impossible. Yeah. And I fully understand that on a certain level. Yeah, languages are not just codes. They stand for something. And when we're talking about languages spoken mostly by poor people who have been hideously mistreated by history, yeah, what I'm saying is it has to be said delicately. But you know what, Daniel? I have said it delicately. You know, I've said it as carefully as anybody could. But the resistance will be impregnable. And I have a book coming out written for linguists, and I tried to write it. Without it, I try to write it as readably as I can. I try not to make it too long. Making the case for the fact that Creoles are actually interesting. Because, you know, if Creoles are just language mixtures, who cares about them? Every language is a mixture. You know, it becomes an anthropological subject. I think Creoles are interesting. I've always wanted them to be interesting because they are. And so I've written it. And yet, no Creolist will change their mind. There's simply nothing that I can do. I can put myself in their heads. I, my mind would not change if I were them. I, I get it. You don't give up things that you have espoused for your entire career. I'm certainly not going to. But I think that the general linguistics community needs to understand that Creoles are interesting and that just because somebody expresses themselves in Chomsky ease, which is not what the nature paper does, but that's a lot of how this debate actually is conducted. Just because somebody expresses themselves in Chomsky ease, or just because somebody uses words like colonialization or essentialist, doesn't mean that they're empirically correct. And I haven't been carrying on the battle properly because I haven't pushed my points hard enough. The media is changing, and I can see that I need to change with it. And so this is this is the beginning of a new approach I'm going to take to making it so that people are not misled 
by an approach that I think is, one, unempirical, and two, threatens to make the languages of our specialty the least interesting on Earth. That was John McWhorter of Columbia University and presenter of the podcast Lexicon Valley. John is making his case. He's done some YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. He's put out his data and his book as well. So Now, I notice as well he makes it very clear that the article that we talked about last week, he gives them their due. He goes, look, you did an interesting study. I don't necessarily concede the rigor of your methodology, but I appreciate your efforts, and I certainly don't think you have an agenda of any kind. No, he, he was really quite... This is the impression I got, that he wasn't out to slam the Blossy paper. No. He was pulling some punches there. It's it's his beef with the big four. Yes. The big four creolists. And, you know, the thing is, with big data, the results are only as good as your data. And the data is only as good as time allows it to be. <laughs> so... That's where you can wedge in a crowbar and crack that sucker open. Okay. Mm. So, well, I think what we need to do then is give Blassie et al. their opportunity to reply to this at some stage. But I think we need to hear more of McWhorter, but we need to hear a track before we do. Since we're talking about how languages begin, let's go with a local track by Bob Evans. And this one is It's a Beginning on RTRFM 92.1. All right, the two gauntlets are on the ground. One is now fighting the other gauntlet. You know what? I've stretched this metaphor quite far. <laughs> Do gauntlets far. do that? I, psh, apparently. <laughs> um, okay, so we had the um, Blasi et al. article from last week that was basically like, everything you thought about how Creoles were formed is wrong. And we've just had the first half of McWhorter going, ah, uh, maybe not so fast on that one. Right. I think we need to hear more, though. We've addressed two of Blasi's three main points. One is that Creoles clearly continue the linguistic structure of the languages that preceded them, and McWhorter has said, no, they're quite different. And the second one is, uh, we don't have any evidence for a pigeon stage preceding Creoles, and John says, well, for, well, we do. for well-documented cases, we actually do. Right. But there's a third point, that there's no evidence for purely Creole features. There's no Creole feature like Creoles. All Creoles have this. Right. Like, if you ran some sort of crazy supercomputer-powered analysis of all languages... Like Glossy did. ...across the board, <laughs> right? You would not just have that computer spit out all Creoles into one little bin going, hey, all these languages are doing weird stuff similarly. Okay, so I decided to ask John, is that true? Is it true that there's no Creole feature? That is this question that's always put forth. It's always said nobody has identified any Creole features, but nobody ever could. Nobody's ever claimed that there's a configuration of, of morphology or syntax that would only occur on a plantation. I mean, it's, it's just it's a straw man. What somebody has said, somebody was me, is that if you identify those three absences I talked about, you always know it's a Creole. If you find a language that doesn't have any you know, grammatical gender or conjugational endings, none of that stuff that makes it so hard for us to learn European languages. That's one thing. It doesn't have tone like Chinese. So even if it does have tones, you could not use the tones and be understood. Then there's another factor, which is that if you're a brand new language, you don't have cases like understand, where you're not standing under anything. Words have not come together and drifted into meanings that don't make any sense anymore because so much time has gone by. We'll say something like, those two people are making out. Now, to make out can mean that you're kissing. It can mean that you're perceiving something. It can mean all sorts of things, and we don't know why. That happens in a language over time. You see that in any older language. In Creole languages that have not grown up around their older languages like Haitian has, you don't see things like that. You don't see anything like understand. So the features are that if you find a language that is naked in those three particular and utterly inconsequential ways, it's a Creole. Now, all languages called Creoles don't display that purely, because like anything interesting, Creolization is clinal, and a Creole might exist with the language that provided its words such that there's bleed. So, for example, in Haitian, Creole has got some understands from French. Because the line between what's a French word and what's a Haitian word, frankly, doesn't exist. But if you're talking about a Creole where the father language hasn't been hanging around for 300 years, they're all the way I describe. And if somebody knows something I don't, I'm waiting. You know, I have said in print, often in a rather unscholarly way, if you will present me with a language spoken God knows where, 
that has those three absences and yet has no history in extensive second language acquisition, I will fold. I will fold like a card house. Nobody's presented it. And you know why, Daniel? It's because that language doesn't exist. So that is the answer (laughs) to the question. I almost get the feeling like they're trying to refute the whole bioprogram hypothesis and they aren't really addressing the claims that you're addressing. Yeah. What do you think about that idea that maybe they, you guys could all be compatible somehow? Um, no. And you know, I wish okay. I could say that because I don't, <laughs> I don't know Blossy, but I know Susanna and Martin well. You know, I have no battle with, with them. Um, they, in their paper, they definitely don't seem terribly concerned with the person who happens to be me. They're kind of skirting by me. And Daniel, this is something that it comes down to. This, this is the heuristic. If nobody remembers anything about this interview, this is something to remember. There's a Creole called Palanquero. It is based on Spanish. It's spoken in Colombia. It's a Spanish Creole. Now, it's handy. Two languages came together to create Palenquero. It wasn't Spanish and 12 African languages. It was Spanish and one African language, Kikongo. Now, it's interesting how I'm pronouncing Kikongo as if it was a romance language. Kikongo. So, Spanish, we all, if you're listening to this, you know what Spanish is like. Conjugations, it's got all these suffixes that are hard to learn from English. Kikongo is the same way. Jangling with prefixes and suffixes and mess and gender and stuff. Spanish and Kikongo came together. People who spoke Kikongo came and they learned some Spanish and they created their own language. It's being spoken still today. That language is like any other Creole in that it barely has anything that you would call a prefix or a suffix. It is nothing like Spanish, nothing like Kikongo in those ways. It shed all of that mess. There's no such thing as you know gender that doesn't make sense. It does not have as many tense markings as Kikonga. It doesn't have subjunctive. It's a Creole language. Now, you could not pay me to have to learn to speak Palenquero because it's a real language, but it doesn't have that kind of mess. Now, what that means is that Palenquero is not just the product of Spanish and Kikongo because it's thrown out almost everything that makes Spanish Spanish and everything that makes Kikongo Kikongo. Now, some word order, I suppose, but if you wanted to talk about grammatical gender, both Spanish and Kikongo assign things to gender for no real reason. They both have it. It's gone from Palenque, and you can give a whole list. Any article that you see, like Blasi, Michaelis, and Haspelman, no matter how good it is in itself, and I think their article is good, is ignoring that Palenquero challenge. That that article is written as if I hadn't laid that down about five years ago. And you can do that exact same challenge with a good couple of dozen other Creoles, as my colleague Peter Bakker at the University of Aarhus in Denmark has shown. And so, a lot of this debate is carried out without acknowledgement of what the articles from the other side are. I don't think that Blasey et al. are doing that on purpose. But it looks so sensible when they say all of this stuff comes from the source languages, there's no lack of continuity. But they're not saying anything about Paul and Caro. And so that's as if somebody, this is very much as if somebody were saying, no mammal can be fully aquatic. No mammal. And they're talking about dogs and squirrels. And then somebody writes a paper where they say, this is called a whale. Here it is. And then, you know, five years later, no mammal can be a... Aqua- and then somebody said, what about the whale? <laughs> That's what this is. <laughs> Except in this case, you know, it's not just the whale. It's as if you went out into the ocean and there's this whole, you know, assemblage of mammals that are underwater and they're really just a few up on land. I hate to say that, that is, that's the terms, and I want to stress, Blasey, Michaelis, and Haspel Math are not doing this on purpose. It's gotten to the point that it's just assumed among a great many people that this case that Creoles are not a kind of language has just you know, been made. I get the feeling a lot of people figure literature review isn't even necessary at this point. That's why I'm going to start making it clearer that we need to reconsider it. Well, I am really looking forward to seeing the stouch that happens. It's, um, you know, it could be a throwdown of Chomsky in proportions. <laughs> we'll see. John McWhorter from Columbia University and the presenter of the podcast Lexicon Valley. So what I want to know is why didn't Blasi et al.'s huge data set spit out these languages, right? Like why didn't it go, 
Uh, putting aside his final challenge there mm -hmm. for a second yep. and just going back to his three voids, his three missing things right. that define Creoles according to his heuristic, shouldn't Blazzy's big data analysis have identified absences as readily as it identified positives. Okay, well, I did actually go back and ask Damien about this, and he confirmed that the algorithm that they use does consider presences and absences. And he found that for Creoles, tone didn't really factor in either way. But then there was also John's idea that Creoles have words whose meanings aren't very confusing, you know, like understands or make outs. I don't know how you would turn that into a feature. Like, you know, a, how would you get a measure of semantic opacity? It would be really hard to pin down. But I mean, you could do it. It's just that somebody would have to do the work. But I would love for John to grab their data set and mm. yes. run his own tests. Good yeah, point. yeah, yeah. What yeah, about yeah, that? Yeah. Hmm. Well, since we did this interview, John McWhorter has indeed been pumping out loads and loads of material about Creoles on YouTube, Facebook, and of course, his podcast, Lexicon Valley. Which we will link to all of. Yes, we will. And if you like listening to John and you want to do more of that, then let me tell you, that's something that you can go ahead and do. His podcast is dope. And not only is his podcast dope, but there's a whole bunch more to this interview that we didn't get time to play. So the full interview is on our Patreon site. And of course, you should listen to full episodes of Lexicon Valley. Absolutely. Well, that was cool. We've basically just in, engaged a creolist turf war. So, <laughs> wicked. Not bad. Yeah, I think we need to take a track. Just chew on that for a little while. Okay, let's listen to one by Slow Dive. This one's called Don't Know Why on RTRFM 92.1. And I'm going to be very well behaved this week for Word of the Week. And instead of giving my insipid, insufferable, like improvised introduction, I am just going to politely welcome G back on the show. What's up, G? G'day, g'day. Hi, how you guys doing? Doing good. We've got some gender-related Words of the Week, but to help us get there, we need our gender studies expert, Jisoo Kwon. Not getting paid enough to be an expert. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you know you're an expert, because you're becoming an expert in it, even without financial incentive. Oh, yes, that's how capitalism works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the Words of the Week is performative. This is a word that's been on my radar for quite a while now, but it's finally come to a head, I think. I ran across this poem, Roses are red, gender's performative, mass market romance is heteronormative. <laughs> oh God, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what it means when we say that something is performative. When I say gender is performative, what am I performing? School the numpkins. <laughs> Alrighty. So, in 1953, Simone de Beauvoir said that one is not born but rather becomes a woman, I believe is the most commonly accepted translation. Right. So, building on that, in 1990, Judith Butler has a theory called performative gender theory, where she argues that nothing about gender is innate or biological. It is all a social construction that we perform. Okay. I can I, understand that. I because feel like that's an idea that doesn't seem too radical to the sort of person who, like, reads The Atlantic and other sort of vaguely left-leaning things. Like, that's, that's not yet like, what? Because I guess, you know, all my life I've been looking at the men in my life and being compared to them and realizing, oh, one day you'll be stepping into those shoes. So I guess I've kind of been... Looking. And there's all the commercial products out there that are telling us this is what a girl is like, this is what a boy is like, and so on. Exactly, because um, especially in post-feminism, uh, where feminist um, ideas have now been kind of linked with neoliberal and capitalist ideas, gender is very much connected to consumer culture, so we are mm. encouraged to buy gender. Mm. Now, I'm noticing a little bit of shift in this word. Uh, I saw it when someone referred to someone's performative dislike of the Oxford comma, and... I got from that the sense of that it that their dislike was sort of put on or ostentatious. Are we seeing are we seeing a synonym link between affected? Yeah, that's that's the sense I got. Right. Okay. I don't know. Have you seen this, G? Um, I have, and I think it's really interesting that we are very 
wary of things that we perceive to be performed because everything is really performed. All of our class and race and gender is all a very performed thing. Like we know how we are perceived by other people and we act in coded ways to send messages that we are part of a group or we are not part of the group. It's, it's essentially the breakfast club rule, right? There's a point in which a lot of people kind of look at each other in detention on a Saturday and be like, oh, wait, are we all trying really hard to just perform who we are for everyone else? And they're like, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. And a really good um, example of how arbitrary performing identity is, is uh, the example I like to use high, is high heels, high heeled shoes. Um, high heeled shoes were invented by... I believe the Persian cavalry because the heels help you ride horses. So they were worn by men to look masculine and and athletic. And then they were worn by women to emulate men's fashion. And then men stopped wearing them because they became too feminine. Right. And I I mean, the other classic one I've always heard trotted out was that traditional young children clothes in Western culture was exactly the opposite. Boys would be dressed in pink and girls would often be dressed in blue. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, exactly. So all of these things are very arbitrary, but nonetheless, they are very important to our society and how we think of ourselves and our identity. So if if I've got you right, G, what I'm hearing from you is this idea that, well, if stuff is a bit affected, we'll nadoy because it's all affected. Like we're all just puffing our chests out in whatever metaphorical aspect you want to name and we probably shouldn't get all bent out of shape about it. Ah, oh, but the thing is, is that we see some identities as more performed than others. Uh. The things that deviate from the norm or the pri- the cultural privilege is considered to be more affected than others. So we see uh, white people putting on what they call a black scent and putting on black mannerisms because the African American identity is seen as a very performed one, whereas white identity is very normal and natural. And we also see this in gender identity, so femininity, especially very high femme um, identity, especially performed by non-cisgender people, is seen as very artificial and very performed, whereas masculinity is just as performative, if not more. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. I have been to the football. (laughs) You can get a drag queen and a drag king after all. Yes? Yes, exactly. Mm. So how do we use this to make our lives better and not be such terrible people? I think it's all about understanding that everything we do is a performance and it is a way to tell people what we want them to see. And if we if we see someone who is performing a, a strong preference or dislike of the Oxford comma, they are trying to say something about their class and social background. Mm. And he who has not sinned should cast the first stone. Right. We all perform... Mm something and if you think about it all of it is very affected and kind of stupid but it is nonetheless important and very difficult to divorce ourselves from so i think we should just have the grace to say look they're doing this thing they want to tell us something noted we got one more word of the week that you might be interested in and that is he peated the what what (laughs) yeah (laughs) i i also would like an answer to that question this one comes from a tweet by nicole gugliucci at noisy astronomer she says my friends coined a word he peated for when a woman suggests an idea and it's ignored but then a guy says the same thing and everyone loves it uh (laughs) Uh, i love that that is so cool he peated i like it as in, uh, I got he peated in that meeting again, or he totally he peated me. I, I feel like repeated would be like a good, rather than the he, the her peated. Because well, it sounds like repeated. Well, we do have uh, situations where this has been documented before. Uh, Gia Malinovich, who is a well known science presenter, she's written programs, she's uh, even you know contributed to many different uh, outlets for getting uh, the science word out there. She also happens to be Brian Cox's wife, the uh, professor. And back in 2010, she wrote an article on the Guardian website about how five years ago, I was some unwanted tag-along girlfriend. Like, I was bloody Yoko Ono in there. I've, I've definitely got examples out there. I've got examples of that. It happened in a meeting where <gasps> a friend of mine, like a, a female professor, she gave an idea, and everyone was kind of, eh? And then I said, I think that Louisa's idea is such a good idea, and then I explained more about it, and everyone thought it was great. But I found that the way out of this was to say, you know, oh, and 
I would just like to amplify Nicole's idea, right? <laughs> Women are definitely encouraged to do that in meetings. You say, did everyone hear that Sarah said, and then we repeat it. Yeah. Mm. Would we call that sheep-eating? <laughs> Sounds a bit like I'm eating sheep, though, so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> well, this brings the man morphemes up to three. We've got man, as in mansplaining or manspreading. We've got bro, as in bromance or bro-propriation, which mm-hmm. is another term for this very nice thing, one. I think. And then also he, or just as in himbo or he-peating. I don't think I've ever been he-peated, actually. Oh, give it time, G. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll happen. But I, I am in gender studies, where men really do know their place. <laughs> <laughs> you go, yeah. Love it. Uh, so but cheeky. I do find that when I am talking um, in public spaces, my my the pitch of my voice drops significantly, and I've also noticed when I when I speak to men, even like male partners, my voice drops in very like weird gravelly kind of sexy Clint Eastwood voice and I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> wow. You're um you're, you're sad performing country again. singer. Yeah, you're performing all the way. <laughs> well gee, thanks so much for talking the talk with us today. No worries, anytime. We are pretty much bang on out of time. Shall we take a track? Yes, let's listen to uh, something about performance. This is one from Parquet Courts off of their human performance album. This one is Berlin Got Blurry on RTRFM 92.1. If you have any questions about anything that's happened in the show, feel free to get in touch with us. Talk the talk at rtrfm.com.au is how you can email us. Call us on 9260-9210. And we're, of course, all over the social media, Facebook and Twitter at TalkRTR. Park at Courts with Berlin got blurry on RTR FM 92.1. That's a fun one. I enjoy them. Yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a good one. <laughs> we got a letter from Jerry, an email. Ah. What did, uh, what did Jerry say? Jerry has a question. How different do you think Grice's maxims and the cooperative principle would be if they were established in this era? And my answer to that is, well, one would be stripy and one would be spotty, I guess. I think that's a really good answer. Good. No, you, let's have a sensible answer. Uh, if you want to know about Grice's maxims, the uh, Gretchen and Lauren at Lingthusiasm have done an entire episode on this, oh. so you should check it out. Uh, let's talk about it. In uh, A long time ago, Herbert Paul Grice came up with this principle called the cooperative principle and that means we usually cooperate when we engage in dialogue Mm. we 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 act like dialogue is benefiting both of us yeah and so we don't go on and on and on and on we don't tell lies purposely we obey the rules i mean sometimes people do those things if they can't help it but usually we we obey the rules and we cooperate turn giving and so on yeah yeah turn taking and also things like uh you know not being too obscure like if i say something like well, my route today was certainly circuitous. You know, that's a way of saying I, I got completely lost. But if I don't want to say I got completely lost, I can say my route got, you know, I, I can say it in a, yeah. in a funny way yeah. to show that I'm being funny. Yeah. Okay. Well, one example of this is Grice's maxim of quality, which is basically say what you believe to be true and adequately supported by evidence. Now, we know that people sometimes lie. Yeah. Uh, Politicians sometimes lie, mm. and uh, but they don't do it overtly. They make carefully worded statements. Use now, what, weasel words. Weasel words and and circumlocutions and and mm. don't quite say it. You know, in a way that can they they can get pinned down on. Yeah, uh, check out an episode of Yes Minister if you have any. <laughs> Classic. Any, yeah, good old Humphrey Appleby. So what I think Jerry is getting at is that in our age, people don't seem to care about what's true, or politicians just lie and say, you know dumb things without caring whether they're true or not and without even worrying about the consequences of what they say. I, I think some are certainly <laughs> that way, not thinking, thinking of any in particular. I'm thinking of one person in particular, actually. I mean, Trump and his surrogates are, are doing something that I've, I've certainly never seen this before mm. in my lifetime. They just lie and contradict each other or and don't, well, Trump especially, and just says thing and then says the other thing and doesn't care. Yeah. Well, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that we're living in a different age? Where are we living in a... We've talked about post-truth before. Uh, are we living in a different age? No, just certain people who weren't in power before are in power. For all we know, this was something that people in the past have been smacking their heads against walls for. It's like, oh, my God, cannot believe what President Lincoln said about this. But maybe it's not as predominant in culture as it, you know, it, as it currently is for examples like Trump. I think Grice would still say that cooperation is important. It's Absolutely. Just, but what counts for cooperation is different. 
There's so many different ways that we can uh, interact and communicate, though, now as well, and mm. more ways that we can check up on each other too, which is a, which is a bonus. We can say, uh, yeah, no, that's not what the facts are. I don't think the rules have changed. I think the norms might have a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hey, you got any plans for the weekend? Well, there's Dukes. <laughs> We're doing Camp Dukes. We're doing yes. a special live show. So if you're on the edge about going, but I you... I know there's a few tickets left. Really have to jump in there and get onto it. Oh, we, we're going to do a live show. So come and see us. We would love to see you. It's going to be, I think it's going to be bigger than last year. I think so too. They seem to have more aspects open for people and they keep posting all these really cool little videos, including one with us in it, believe it or not. I, we forced Ben to play Scrabble. <laughs> yes. It was hilarious. <laughs> Thanks everyone for paying your Radiothon pledges. Yes. Our naughty list is empty and you guys are awesome. Yes. We have the best people out there. And of course, if if you are willing to become a subscriber, do it. Seriously. Come on. Jump on it. It's not too late. And certainly, if you've still got something overdue, get onto it now. You can also check us out on Facebook and Patreon for all the extra little goodies and bonus stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're always throwing memes and graphics and posts up there. You so want to see what we get up to behind the scenes? There's your <laughs> chance. Check it out for yourself on, on Talk the Talk. And next, you should keep listening because we are going to be listening to Mark Neal, who's taking us out to lunch for all the latest and greatest new music. Uh, we'll be back again, but until then, keep talking. This has been an RTRFM podcast. RTRFM is an independent community radio station that relies on listeners for financial support. You can subscribe online at rtrfm.com.au slash subscribe. Our theme song is by R Trees, and you can check out their music on rtrees.com and everywhere good music is sold. We're on Twitter at TalkRTR. Send us an email, talkthetalk at rtrfm.com.au. And if you'd like to get lots of extra linguistic goodies, then like us on Facebook or check out our Patreon page. You can always find out whatever we're up to by heading to Talk. TalkTheTalkPodcast.com.